Tiffany here. I'm very excited. Welcome to our The Year of the Bride Fast. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be good. And uh, I'm excited to get started. Uh, I won't keep you long, actually. And so uh, let's get right into it. A few months ago, I think it was sometime back in December, God had me release the word of the Lord for um, the next year. Anytime the year comes up, whether I share it privately or publicly, one of the things I've made a habit of is um, just seeking God's face about what he's doing in the next year. I believe as people of God, nothing should ever catch us off guard. Nothing should ever surprise us. Why? Because we have a supernatural advantage to see ahead of time so that we can be prepared for it. The Bible says that the God of this world, lowercase g, is the devil. And um, and so because we're believers of Jesus Christ, what happens in this world system is not advantageous to us anyway. And so we do need a supernatural helper, which is the perfect gift that God gave to us when he died on the cross, which was the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost comes with gifts. And these gifts you don't have to earn. You don't have to be good enough to have. Um, you just need to uh, be one of God's beloved and you have the, the gifts. And so uh, I'm always seeking God's face to see what he's doing next on this earth, just so I'm not caught off guard and the people that are, um, you know, in covenant with me are not caught off guard. And uh, and so, uh, you know, God has really kept me abreast about every single year. Nothing has caught me off guard or the people that I'm with. And this was no different. And so as I was seeking the um, God about the word of the Lord for 2022, he told me that this was the year of the bride. And uh, and you can watch that live. I'll actually put all of this stuff I'm going to mention today in the description box of this um, live. So don't worry, you'll have links to everything. But he told me that this was the year of the bride. Now you may say, Tiffany, this is on point. This is so good. But the thing is, I was a little shaky about it, as I kind of am with everything that God says to me, um, because I am not a prophet that prophesies marriages. I'm not a prophet that prophesies houses and cars. I am just kind of whatever God says is what it is, whether it's a hard word or a good word. You know, I give that word, but I am not one of those um, people that prophesy marriages, nor do I emphasize marriages, nor do I, I'm not like a relationship coach or guru. So I was, uh, I was a little taken aback about the word of the Lord. And then, um, I, you know, the word that I gave was a two part word. It was a word for the bride and Christ, his church and how we were supposed to uh, align with that. And then it was also about supernatural marriages. And I thought that was very powerful. But in that live specifically, God gave me a word of the Lord for mad men in the exact same live. And I almost did not share that publicly um, because it just didn't make any sense. And I was like, well, you know what? I'm good for being obedient. Let me just say it and let the chips fall where they may. And unfortunately we've been seeing this year uh, and we'll see a lot more this year uh, men literally losing their minds, um, just just the most wildest suicides, the most wildest blowing your brains out, blowing their brains out, blowing everybody's brains out that's around them. I'm not I'm not prophesying it. It is what it is unless we do something about it as believers. Um, and so when I released that word, uh, the year of the bride and mad men, I did not have a revelation of what is happening now that I have the revelation today. And just a few weeks ago, um, as I was just watching just so many things in the news and on social media about mad men come to light, I heard the spirit of God say to me, just like God gives us prophetic words and we get really excited about them and we just, um, you know, cheerlead them on. The enemy also has something in line to combat what God says. And a lot of the times we miss out on what God is doing because we didn't wage a good warfare against it. We kind of just lay down and let the enemy do whatever he want to do. You wake up in the morning, you let him molly whop, you punch you in the stomach. You got a black eye in the realm of the spirit, broken jaw in the realm of the spirit. You know what I'm saying? Punctured lung in the realm of the spirit because he done stabbed you all up. And we don't fight back. And... Um, the Holy Ghost really just uh, implanted in me that just like God had this release of supernatural marriages come about, there is a reason why we are seeing such a high level 
of madmen. This is not a coincidence. And if you could see what's going on in the realm of the spirit, you would not be surprised as to why these men are all of a sudden losing their minds in such a great way. There is something that God is doing on this earth that he wants to push forth through us. And we're going to make that happen uh, uh, this year because God is good and, you know, it just is what it is. We can't lose. We already have the victory. So I want you to know uh, that history belongs to the intercessors and history belongs to those who will turn down their plates in prayer and fasting. This is who history belongs to. I know that we have many people on here that think that because we are living in the end times, um, Jesus is gonna, God is gonna do whatever he wants to do and there's nothing we can do about it. But that is a lie from the pit of hell. As a matter of fact, uh, God gave us so much power and authority that we actually have power and authority to push some things back so that it doesn't happen during our time um, and things of that nature. Because above all, God wishes that as many people as possible be saved instead of everybody going to hell. And if he came back right now, man, there's an awful lot of people going straight to hell with gasoline draws on. And so I know that many of you believe we're living in the end times, and I'm sure we are. Um, and they also thought that about a thousand years ago that we were living in the end times. Jesus does not even know when the end is. I don't know if you read that in scripture. I don't know if I'm telling you something that's a surprise, but not even Jesus himself knows when God is coming back, um, which means that we don't know. Our job is to stay ready so we don't have to get ready when he comes. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and so we are going to uh, wage a good warfare against this. Um, the Holy Spirit uh, really implanted in my heart to do a fast for this. And so we will be fasting the year of the bride, marital breakthrough. We will be fasting every single Tuesday for the rest of this year between the hours of 6 a.m. and 3 p.m., whatever your time zone is. And we will be praying on YouTube Live. So make sure you're subscribed to my YouTube channel every single Tuesday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 11 a.m. Central Standard Time, 10 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 5 p.m. over in my beloved Nigeria, 4 p.m. in Ghana, 3 a.m. in Australia, since I have a lot of people over there. And, uh, and we will be praying every Tuesday live. I want you to make sure that you're committed to this fast. So please don't join it if you're somebody that's going to be in and out and do what you want to do and feel like you want to take a prophetic pause on whatever Tuesday because you're too busy to do it. Don't even join it. And uh, you may say, well, Tiffany, that's so religious. You don't want to, you, you don't want to be judgmental, but here's the thing. And I could care less about what half of y'all got to say. But here's the thing, right? I believe that we have not seen um, great moves of God like they've seen in the book of Acts. I don't believe that we've seen great exploits like um, generals in our past that have now gone on to be with God. I don't believe that we've seen the dead risen and the, in the, in the capacity that we should be able to see it because we house the Holy Ghost inside of us because we don't operate on one accord. Let's just be very clear. And so there is something that unity does um, and operating on one accord, all of us as believers, that it, 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 it puts such a damage in the realm of the spirit that there is nothing we can't have and nothing we can't produce if we are operating on one accord all of us. And so the reason I am saying, hey, let's make a vow that every single Tuesday, sometimes I might be not be able to come live on YouTube to pray on Tuesday, but I have committed. I have made a vow to God that every single Tuesday from the hours of 6 a.m. to 3 p.m., I will be contending. I will be fasting. I will be praying. I will be turning down my plate. I will be seeking the face of God. I will be humbling myself. I will be ushering these men back to the altar through the um, through intercession. I have have given God my commitment. And, um, and I'm asking you to give God your commitment too, because let's just be real. A lot of us have not given God our commitment in a very long time. We have not um, given God our time. We haven't, social media gets more of our time than God does. We haven't given God our praise. We haven't given God our worship. We haven't given God our, um, our, our, his secret place, you know, we just haven't, if we're just going to be honest here, this fast is going to do a lot more than just supernatural marriage. It's really going to be a reset for us. It's going to be, I want you to look at yourself like a cell phone. And I want you to look at yourself like that cell phone that is like, 
acting wonky and always having technical issues and you're like, you know what, let me power this thing down and power it back up so it can work again. Many of you are going to have a divine reset um, in this hour and it's just going to be beautiful and it's going to be glorious and all of that. So let's make a commitment that every single Tuesday for the rest of this year between the hours of 6 a.m. and 3 p.m., whatever your time zone is, we will be fasting. Fasting, the biblical definition of fasting is to abstain from all food for a certain period of time. Now, I know we live in an age where you think that you can um, misinterpret the Bible and do what you want to do because we just live at a different time. But the Bible doesn't change just because you have decided to change it. The true definition of a biblical fast is you um, abstaining from all food for a certain period of time. Now, I've always thought it was fascinating that the very first sin in the Bible was because of food and that is the reason why God wants us to turn down our plate. Um, you turning down social media, you turning down TV, you turning down talking on the phone to somebody, those are beautiful things. Those are great consecrations to God, but it is not the definition of a true biblical fast. And if you want the results of a true biblical fast, because a fast is powerful, it's one of the fastest way to get your prayers answered. And that's why he says, this thing, when a man came to God's Jesus's disciples, his son was like a, literally a madman. His son was throwing himself into the fire. His son was a cutter. He was mutilating his body by cutting himself. And, um, and his son was literally had lost his mind. His disciples couldn't do anything about it. And Jesus said, this kind, this kind only come out by prayer and fasting. So if you have now um, changed fasting to be something like turning down social media, not gossiping for the day, you not having sex for the day, and you shouldn't be having sex no way because you're not married. Well, this kind is still going to stay there because you can't change the definition of it because you feel like it. Now, the reason why fasting might be pretty difficult for many of you is because you're dealing with food. You're dealing with the appetite of your belly. You're dealing with your flesh. And uh, you never know how much you got going on on the inside of you or how many spirits are in there just going to rage at you until you decide to turn down your plate. Um, because here's the thing, food whether you eat a lot or not, right? Food has become a God to many of, many of you, lowercase g. Food has become your God. Food has dictated your discipline. Food has dictated your personality. Food has taken over you. This is why it's hard for you um, to eat right. This is why it's hard for you to get off of caffeine and coffee and sugar and all of that stuff and candy and chips and, you know, pastas and all of those things. It's because no matter how saved you think you are, no matter how good you think you are, no matter how righteous you think you are, food will, will always make a fool of you. And so this is why we are turning down our plate. We are going to allow this thing that has taken or has become God to us uh, in so many ways. We're going to turn down our plates and we're going to kill it so that we are not struggling in this area anymore. Now, here's the thing. I know many of you will feel like you are going to die on a fast when you don't eat any food. You may say, Tiffany, I don't even eat breakfast anyway. But here's the thing. When you tell, it's one thing to just not eat until one o'clock or two o'clock, right? It's another thing when you have told your body that you're going to fast and you're not going to eat all of a sudden, you ain't ate at 9 a.m. for 10 years now. All of a sudden you wake up and your stomach is just gut punching you everywhere. And it's like, feed me now. It's a spiritual thing. So please understand that we're not operating in the natural right now. We're operating in the realm of the spirit and uh, your flesh who has become your God. This is why you masturbate and you can't stop. This is why you have sex out of wedlock and you can't stop. This is why you gossip and you lie on people and you can't stop. This is why you falsely accuse and bear false witnesses against people and you can't stop. This is why you have so much unforgiveness and bitterness in your heart and and, and resentment in your heart because you can't stop. It's because this dirty, nasty, stinky flesh of yours is in control. And our purpose of fasting is to take our control back and give it back to God, right? We want to make God the rightful, uh, we want to give God his rightful, rightful position back in our lives again. We want to give God rule, reign, and dominion back over our lives again. And we want to take our flesh back out of it again. And so we want to make sure that we are doing uh, first things first. Now, here's the thing that's going to blow you away, right? Fasting and prayer is one of the quickest ways to get your prayers answered. Uh, fasting is obviously made by Jesus. And of course, we see that many people can counterfeit 
everything that God does. This is why instead of uh, many people serving God, they serve the universe. And this is why many people have counterfeit Holy Spirits by calling on their ancestors and spirit guides and things of that nature. The enemy has always counterfeited everything that God does. But I have good news for you. The devil is not the opposite of God. The devil is the opposite of Michael, the angel. Okay. Let's just be very clear. And so we are, um, we already have the victory because God is undefeated and he has no equal. He has no competition, right? The devil is a competition of Michael, the archangel, uh, Michael, the archangels. Also, Fasting and prayer, again, is one of the fastest way to get your prayers answered. What fasting cannot do by itself, when you partner it with, uh, what, what prayer can't do by itself, when you partner it with fasting, it's literally like dynamite. It's like dynamite to what you've been asking God for. And it literally blows up. Uh, whatever wall or whatever hindrance or whatever demonic dam was in the way to getting that prayer answered. Um, and so fasting works no matter if you're a Satanist, a Buddhist, a Hindu. Why? Because it is a, it is a principle like, um, like, uh, like gravity, right? Just because you are a Satanist doesn't mean that what goes up doesn't come down, right? Just because you're Buddhist or Hindu doesn't mean what goes up doesn't come down. Uh, it doesn't, just because you're a psychic doesn't mean that what comes up doesn't come down. It's the principle of gravity. It works either way. Well, fasting and prayer is exactly the same thing. This is why so many of them are more um, dedicated to fasting than you are, than believers are, than Christians are, because they have a revelation of how powerful this thing is, uh, no matter what religion it is. And so um, the, God, the, the uh, ministry that God has given me is called Covered by God. And before it's anything else, it's a prayer and fasting ministry. Um, and it's also a prophetic and teaching ministry. But God is, God is wanting to bring prayer and fasting back into the body of Christ because he knows how, well, obviously he created it, but um, he wants us to know how powerful it is you know, to, to pray and fast and to get things to move. Well, you may say, well, Tiffany, things are going to happen whether we say them or not. Things are going to move whether we say them or not. Like that's just how life is, right? But I want to take you to Genesis and I want you to grab your Bibles. We're just going to take a little journey here and there. You know what I should have did? Let's take a journey. Uh, I'm really just getting these scriptures off the top of my head because. Okay, this is powerful. If you go to Genesis chapter one, verse two, we go to Genesis chapter one, verse two. Uh, the Bible says, well, first of all, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. So right now, again, this fast is for whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you're widowed, whether you're divorced, whether you're engaged, it does not matter if God has called you, if, if you have a desire in your heart to be married then God will grant that desire. For those of you that are like, well, everybody isn't supposed to be married. Well, those people know that. They have a special gift that God has given them to remain celibate for the rest of their lives. And so if you are somebody that has said, I have a desire for marriage, then you, uh, by the grace of God, will get married, right? Now, I want you to look at, now everybody on here does not have a bad relationship. Let's just be clear, right? They've been lying to us all these years saying that marriage is bad and everybody got to go through something. The devil is a liar. There are people on this live that are part of how powerful fasting and prayer is. Um, and so that's the thing. But if you are on here and you have been, uh, I want you to look at your relationship right now, if this applies to you as something that's um, without form and void and darkness is a pawn it and all of that stuff. And I want you to notice that God said, let there be light. And there was light. Let there be light and be light. And there was light. Let there be light. And there was light. This is going to bless you in a second. And God saw that the light and it was good. And he divided it. And I, and he divided it. And I also love, uh, let me say it again. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of waters. Isn't it powerful that the spirit, before he said, let there be anything, let's be clear. The spirit of God was already there. Isn't it powerful that the power of God was there? The presence of God was there 
but nothing was formed until he spoke it out of his mouth, which means that you can still house the power of God, the presence of God, the Holy Ghost can be on the inside of you, the Holy Spirit can be moving all over your life, but until you use your mouth, but until you use this thing that God has set as a powerful tool on you, until this thing that God has set as a powerful tool on you, until you say, let there be light in my marriage, let there be light in my life concerning marriage, let there be light in, as far as strategies is concerned and confusion is, let there be light. There wasn't anything that happened until he spoke it, even though the Holy Ghost was present and the power of the Holy Ghost was upon that thing. So let's just be crystal clear. One second. Papa! That was so ghetto. Okay. I'm so sorry. That's just who I am as a person. We are on Genesis chapter one, verses two and three. Pop, go hand me my charger, please, buddy. Thank you so much. Um, it's so powerful. So, so. Papa! Yeah. Matter of fact, can you get my key, the car key out my purse, get the charger out of the car, and then bring that to me? Wait, say that again? Get my key out of my purse, get my charger out of the car, and then bring that charger to me. I'm so sorry, y'all. It's so ghetto, okay? It's just welcome to my life. Hood central, okay? Anywho. Okay. So, uh, but I want you to know how powerful our words are. This, is, this life is going to be quick. Don't you worry. I want you to know how powerful our words are. And so you may say the presence of God is here. The power of God is here. Why haven't I seen my marriage come to pass? Why isn't this thing working for me? Again, I want you to use Genesis 1 verses 2 and 3 as your example. The spirit of God was there. He was moving, all of that. But until God said, let there be light, let there be light, let there be light, there was no light. Now, can I challenge your thinking for a second? I want to challenge your thinking for a second, um, just because I'm on this light, just because I'm on this light part of it. I want to challenge your thinking for this second. Genesis 2, 22. Go with me to Genesis 2, 22. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her to the man. Now, this is the staple scripture that God gave me for the year of the bride because we're in year 2022. And this was a scripture, Genesis 2, 22. And the rib which the Lord had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Um, and so we've had a little bit of misconception about God, um, uh, you know, uh, whoso finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor for the Lord. But I also want to let you know that uh, we have not really rightly had revelation on what that meant. So let me just say to you really quickly that God presents the wa the woman to the man. This is scriptural. God presents the woman to the man. The man does not have to go out looking for the woman. Now, women, you're not going to go hunt for the man. That's not what you're doing. But God will prepare you and posture you and present you to the man. When you read Genesis 2, 22 in the message version, the Bible says, God put the man into a deep sleep. And as he slept, he removed one of his ribs and replaced it with flesh. Then he used the rib that he had taken from the man to make woman. And he presented her to the man. He presented her to the man, right? Uh, I just want to just give you some uh, and in the Amplified, it says, in the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he fashioned and formed into a woman and he brought her and presented her to the man. So you may say, well, Tiffany, why does it say that a man that finds a wife find a good thing? Why is it, why is it that way? That doesn't make any sense. Why is the Bible contradicting itself? Because these things are both, oh, excuse me, y'all. These things are both in the new covenant. So why is it contradicting itself all of a sudden? And it it's not contradicting itself. I just don't think we've had a revelation. But because we're on this light topic, I want to show you something. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22. The Bible says, whoso findeth a wife 
find whoso findeth the wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor from the Lord. Can we just do a little bit of a uh, Bible just clarity for one second? Anytime you see the word saith, moveth, doeth, findeth, obtaineth, anytime you see I T H or E T H after any word, it lit over and over again. It literally means something that God wants you to do over and over and over again. This is why when Ezekiel was put in the valley of dry bones, he said, prophesy to this mountain and say it. He said it over and over again. This meant that Ezekiel wasn't supposed to prophesy to these valley of dry bones just one time. He was supposed to do it over and over and over and over and over again, over and over and over again. So when you see whoso findeth a wife, findeth the good thing and obtain favor for the Lord, what you want to do is you want to go to, okay, so I use the Blue Letter Bible app. I don't know why me showing you thought that that was going to help y'all find it. If you go to the app store, it's free. It's called the Blue Letter Bible app. And in this app, okay, it has a concordance. So here's a scripture right here. What I'm going to do is click on it. Don't mind this finger. Uh, and then I'm going to click on concordance right here. And it's going to take me to all the words that I want to look up. Any of the words in the Old Testament is the Hebrew definition of that word. And all the words in the New Testament is the Greek definition of that word. So what I like to do personally, because y'all be trying to play me sometimes, lying to me about these scriptures that y'all been just believing these people about all these years and you have not been rightly dividing the scriptures for yourself. I like to say maybe findeth means something different because if scripture in Genesis 2.22 lets me know that God presented um, Adam's wife to her. He was asleep. He didn't even know that he needed a wife. He didn't even know that he needed a helper. So God brought her and presented her to him. But then I see in Proverbs 18, 22, that whoso findeth the wife, findeth the good thing. Well, that's contradictory. And that is why so many of our men of God are having problems when the woman is presented to them and they're like, this can't be my wife because all my life I've thought that I needed to find her. Well, I wanted some answers, right? Because I look at Boaz and, you know, she presented herself to him. I look at Rebecca and Isaac. Isaac did not go out looking for his wife. Rebecca had to present herself to him, right? And so here I go and I look at the word find it because in my mind, I'm like, if, uh, if a man finds a wife, why is he having to do it over and over and over again? So I click on the word findeth. Here's what I think is so powerful about this word. And this is the reason why I wanted to share this with you. When I look up the word findeth, I look at the word and it means many things, but one of it means to, to meet, to encounter. It means to detect like a detective, right? It means to uh, have light come upon it. It means to have light come upon it. It means to be encountered and discovered, y'all. That's what findeth means. It means to be gained and to be secured. It means to be found sufficient. It literally means um, to present as an offering. Uh, but one of the things I want you to really sh focus on for this is it means to have light come upon it. It means to have light come upon it, which means that God can have men, for all of the men that's on here, God could have presented your wife to you right now. And because, you know, I don't know, maybe you've been deceived. Maybe you're in strong delusion. Maybe you have not, you know, come into the full counsel of God concerning her. There is still darkness around this situation, but it's going to take the revelation of God. It's going to take the light of God to give you revelation to who this woman is in your life, even though she's already been presented to you, if that makes sense. And the reason it says findeth is because even when you have this good wife, even when you marry her, you're going to continually be finding that she's a good thing for you, that she's a benefit for you, that she's advantageous to you. Let's look up the word good in the, in the Greek definition. It means she's um, excellent of her kind. She's rich. She's valuable. Um, she is happy. She's prosperous. She has good understanding. She's kind. She's ethical, right? She's, um, she's morally good. She's beautiful. And so um, you're going to find this over and over and over again in your wife. And that's why he says, and you're going to obtain it favor from the Lord. He's that forever 
over and over and over again, you're going to obtain this favor. Proverbs 18, 22 was never meant to be a one-time thing. This was a lifetime journey that a man who has the wisdom to see the light of God in this wife who has been presented to him already, which means that he didn't have to go searching for her because he didn't even know he needed her. Um, now going to need the light of God to show her. I think Genesis one, um, is so powerful when he said the hope, the spirit of God was already there, but he had to speak, let there be light. And so men of God, I want you to start just declaring over your life, let there be light in this marital situation so that you can see counsel of God concerning this matter, um, concerning your marital matter. Now, let me just say a few things, not that I haven't said a trillion things so far. There's a, uh, and I'm going to put this all in the description box. So if I talk fast, don't, it's all going to be there as soon as I get off of this live. But there's a book I want you to read, actually uh, a few books, but um, the books I want you to read for the rest of this month is a book called Words by Kenneth Hagin, because a lot of you are going to speak against this thing and you can't speak against what you're believing God for. And so it's a word. It was, it was a book called Words by Kenneth Hagin. It takes you maybe 15, 20 minutes tops to read. That's how short it is. That's a book that we're going to read every single um, month every single month, right? And there's another book I want you to read called God is My Matchmaker by Kenneth Hagen, uh, by Derek Prince, the late Derek Prince. Both of those um, ministers are late, but Derek Prince is one of my favorite um, Bible teachers. And here's an excerpt for this that I think is mind blowing. And I want you to just, you know, just allow this to break up any misconceptions you have, because everything I'm getting ready to say right now is from the book, God is my matchmaker. And all of this is from the Bible. So he says specifically, the Bible reveals seven principles about marriage, all of which still apply today. Number one, God himself initiated marriage at the beginning of human history. Adam had no part in planning it. Without divine revelation, man cannot understand it, much less make it a part of his experience. Number two, the decision that the man was to marry came from God, not from the man. Number three, God knew the kind of helper the man needed. The man did not. Number four, God prepared the woman for the man. Number five, God presented the woman to the man. The man did not have to go and search for her. Number six, God ordained the nature of their life together and its end purpose was unity right? Number seven, God upheld, uh, Jesus upheld God's original plan of marriage as binding on all who would become his disciples. And it's still in effect today. And so one of the major reasons that marriage is on the mind of God is to really push the kingdom agenda forward. I don't know if you made aware of this, but we don't live by the world standards. We are all a part of a kingdom and that kingdom is the kingdom of God. And this kingdom has a specific set of rules, regulations, legalities that we need to apply with in order to see this kingdom agenda come to pass. And one of those agendas is the first institution that God ever created, which was marriage. Now, when these husbands, and wives come together God specifically has been talking to me about the husband and wife um, being oil and fire. And what we're going to see is an explosion in the kingdom because the very first thing God wanted us to focus on was the family unit. Now, these husband and wives, the reason they're going to be so powerful is because of the a level of supernatural agreement they're going to come into. It's the agreement God needs us to come into. And so I know that we hear that we're supposed to go out two by two and we're going to be on one accord as, body, as bodies of believers, but there is something different different God is going to do in husbands and wives because these people have morphed into one person and whatever they come into agreement on earth, according to the will of God, we are going to see happen in very quick ways. Also, according to first Peter three, seven, the Bible says as long, as long as the husband treats his wife, right, his prayers will not be hindered, which means men, if you're on here right now, if you are a nasty man, if you beat your wife, if you're abusive in any way, if you are just a jerk, you know what I'm saying? You're going to want to fix that because I can guarantee you, and I don't have to be a prophet to say this, a blind person can see this coming. Your prayers are being hindered according to 1 Peter 3, 7. So it would behoove you to treat your wife like yourself, love her like Christ loved the church so that your prayers can be answered. That's how powerful marriage is to God. That's how powerful this covenant is to God. And so um, uh, another thing I want to talk about really quickly is rings and restoration. God had been uh, one of the scriptures I have not been able to get out of uh, for a very long time is Jeremiah 33. 
And uh, it's just a powerful chapter in the Bible, but he specifically talks about this desolate land. And he says, I'm going to restore this place that was once desolate. Nothing could grow there. No animal could even live there. That's how, that's how dead it was. I'm going to restore it. And you're going to now hear the voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bride, the voice of the bridegroom. You can read the rest of Jeremiah 33 to see it. But you know what I had never read? I had never read Jeremiah 16 or probably did and just didn't pay no mind to it. But when God, God cursed the land, uh, first of all, in Jeremiah 16, and what he said was to prove to you that this land is no more is cursed, to prove to you that I've cursed it. He said, I'm going to take away the voice of the bridegroom and the bride. I'm going to take away the sound of joy and gladness. I was blown away which lets us know, hear, hear the revelation in this, which lets us know that you can tell that a land or a region or a territory or a church has been cursed when you no longer hear the voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice of bride and the voice of the bridegroom. That lets you know that there is something over that territory that God has snuffed out. And then you know that restoration to this territory, restoration to this region, restoration to this country, restoration to this body of Christ, restoration to the houses of, of, of men, restoration happens when these voices come back. This is why I said, please go back and watch my um, cover by God called your schedule for a new season because our new season is not seen. It's proclaimed out of our mouth. This is why he said, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to know restoration has come by the voice of it. Not that you saw it, but it's going to be the voice of joy, the voice of of, of gladness, the voice of the bride, the vo celebration is going to be your indicator that God has restored a nation, that God has restored a region, that God has restored a territory, that God has restored the body of Christ. We're going to see marriages happen like never before because God is restoring it and we're going to prophesy and fast and contend for this thing to come through that, that, it's just exciting. I got to just calm down because sometimes I just get ahead of myself and I get a little bit more excited than I should. Uh, and so uh, let me do a caveat here. Many of us are going to get married in a blink of an eye. It's going to happen suddenly. It's going to come out of nowhere. It's going to come out the blue. You may say, Tiffany, I don't even have anybody that uh, you might not have got hit on in 10, 15 years. It does not matter. When the hand of God is on something, when we're all operating on one accord, when we're putting first things first, you know, God is a miracle working God. We're talking, we're not talking about a man. We're not talking about a God that you should keep in that box you put them in. We're talking about God who created heaven and earth. We're talking about God who heaven is his throne. The earth is his footstool and the clouds in the sky are but dust to his feet. We're talking about God. I want you to visualize what that looks like. You're talking about God that gave the ocean a boundary and said, you can flow, but stop here. And then you see land again. We're talking about God almighty and nothing is impossible to God. This is going to be a light thing for God to do. This is going to be easy for God to do. Um, you know, nothing will be impossible to God. And one of the things I think is very pow powerful about the word impossible, because you may be looking at it like, Tiff, God told me this guy was my husband, or uh, Tiff, God told me this woman was my wife, and this is just seems so impossible. But I want you to know nothing is impossible to God. And here's a th here's the thing, because this is why you want to stand on scriptures, and this is why we want to start looking up the definition of the words. The word impossible in the Bible, I'm sorry, the word impossible by definition on Google means... Um, not able to occur, not able to exist, out of the question. It literally means out of the question. It literally means unthinkable, unimaginable, irrational. It literally means hopeless, right? It literally means ridiculous. Another definition means very difficult to deal with. And another definition means of a person who is very unreasonable. This person is unmanageable. This person is wayward. This person is difficult. This person is perverse. This person is unbearable. This person is maddening. Madmen. The word impossible literally means madmen. You're dealing with madmen here. But here's what God is saying. Nothing is impossible. Nothing. 
nothing. Luke 1 37, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. That woman that you've been praying about, not, this is easy to God. This man that you've been praying about, nothing shall be impossible. But you got to be with God. So it's going to be impossible with you. But you got to, if you're with God, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Um, so we talked about how Genesis 2.22 was one of our staple scriptures. But I want to give you Genesis uh, 22.2. Go to Genesis 22.2. Here's one of the things that the spirit of God is telling you to do, right? I'm dealing with a lot of people during this fast. It's, it's thousands of you um, that are joining this fast. And here's the thing. A lot of you have made a man or a woman an idol. A lot of you have believed that you heard God say that somebody was your husband or your wife. And a lot of you have made this person an idol or in other words, uh, you are now, this person has now become God to you and you worship them in the area of worry. You worship this thing in the area of worry. You can also make marriage an idol. You can make anything an idol. You know, what was once good can be turned into an idol. What is an idol? I know a lot of us think we've heard it back in the day, but an idol is anything that is above your obedience to God. So anytime something takes your brain space, anytime something becomes an obsession to you, anytime something, you know, you start worrying about it so much that you can't even think straight anymore, that thing has become an idol to you. And I believe personally, a lot of you have not seen your prayers answered and they've been hindered because of idolatry. And so um, just as God has spoken to us in Genesis 2.22, in the year 2022, God is also speaking to us in Genesis 22.2. And I thought that this was so powerful. Uh, and in and, and this story, and I'll give you the Tiffany version God, Abraham had been waiting on this baby for a very long time. We all know the story about Abraham. If you don't, here's the time to go and study it for the rest of your day. Here, God has, uh, Abraham has been giving Isaac. We don't know what happened. Maybe Isaac turned, maybe Abraham turned Isaac into an idol. Maybe the time that Abraham gave to God was now given over to his son and God didn't have his time back. And so what God told him to do was he said, I want you to sacrifice your son for me. I want you to sacrifice him. I want you to, I want you to sacrifice him. And the Bible says in Genesis 22, 2, and he said, take now your son, your only son, take that desire you have, your only desire for marriage, that thing that you lovest. And I want you to offer that thing there as a burnt offering. The Bible says Abraham rose up early in the morning. Abraham did not did not contend with God. Abraham did not uh, go back and forth with God. Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and he went up to the place that God told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Here's, here's verse five. This is what's powerful. And Abraham said unto the young men, stay here with the ass and I and the lad will go up yonder and worship and we're coming back to you again. Do y'all understand? Do y'all understand what's happening here? Abraham was told to kill his only son, the only one you love. He didn't argue with God. He didn't do none of that. And then he said to his, this is why he's the father of faith. He went and told the people, hey, watch these, watch this. We're going to go up there and worship and we're coming back down. God told him to kill this thing on an altar. And he still has so much faith and said, we're coming back to you again. Me, we're coming back. Because he believed that the God that was that had requested that he killed his son was the same God that had the power to resurrect him back up again. That he knew 
that this thing that God promised him, God promised him a child. God told Abraham he was going to have a son. God told him that he was going to be the father of many nations. God told him what the, what the prophecy on his son's life was for. And Abraham was a man that has so much faith that he said, the prophecy concerning my son's life has not been fulfilled, which means that if God has called me to kill this thing, he has to resurrect him back again because he's God. They don't call him Alpha and Omega for nothing. That means that God was, is not going to start something he does not finish. They don't call him the beginning and the end for nothing. That means that God is not going to start this desire in your heart and not finish it. They don't call him the author and the finisher of our faith for nothing, which means that God is not just going to write this love story out for you and not finish it. He is not like us. We start things and don't finish it. He is not like man. Abraham, the father of faith, had so much faith in God that even though God requested that he killed this thing, he knew, he said, we're going to go up, we're going to worship, and we're going to come back to you again. And of course, you know, you know what happened. Obviously, the angel stopped him. He had laid him on down, was getting ready to go kill him. And, uh, and the angel said, no, you don't have to kill him. You know, thank you for your services. Um, he said, verse 12, the angel of the Lord came to him and said, don't lay hands on your son. Uh, don't do anything to him. Be now I know that you fear God. Now, For now I know that you fearest God, seeing that you did not withhold your, your only son from me. And I believe in this hour that God wants to give us the desire of our heart, but he wants to make sure that we still fear him. He wants to make sure that when you get into the supernatural marriage, that you won't forget about him. He wants to make sure that when you, um, that you get the desires of your heart, this thing won't become a golden calf to you. It won't become the thing that is now taking the place of God. Uh, you won't look at this woman like God. You won't worship her. You won't look at this man like God. You won't worship him. But that God is still God in your life and you will um, love and honor and do all the things with your husband and wife like you're supposed to do as the head of your house. But both of you still knowing that God is God. And I believe God just wants to know this desire that I gave you, this thing that uh, you know, you've been pleading and begging with me for, can you lay this at the altar? Can you kill it? Is this thing that's become an idol today on the first day of our fast. Can you say, God, I lay this thing at the altar to you. I want you to kill this. I want you to kill this, this thing that I believe you told me was mine, my only desire. I want you to kill it. And why am I asking you to kill it? I want, I want you to kill it because I know that you gave me a prophetic promise over my life and over my marriage. You gave me a promise and I know this promise has not been fulfilled. God, I know that you're the God that when something dies, here's the thing about God. God, when, when that thing dies, it multiplies. When you kill something, it literally becomes bigger. I'm going to find you the scripture for that. If one of y'all can find the scripture for me, please do it. Find that scripture for me. But that's the thing about God. Nothing, you can't, this is why we kill our flesh. Us killing our flesh multiplies all the good things and the righteousness that God has on the inside of us. When you killing your flesh doesn't mean you die and go six feet under, you killing your flesh actually gives you more life. It actually aligns you to the things of God. You can hear what God is saying stronger. You have more visions and more dreams. God gives you more revelation when you kill your flesh. That's the thing about the natural. In the natural, when you kill things, it dies and it has no more breath in it. But in the things of the spirit, when you kill that thing, it comes back even better and bigger than before. And God just wants to see you kill it because that thing has not been accomplished in your life. The only response to that thing being dead is God resurrecting it back up again, if he's going to kill it dead. So if you're dealing with a separation right now from your God ordained spouse or your prodigal spouse, if you're dealing with something and it looks like it's dead, I want, I want you to just do what Abraham did when he was going up there. I want you to praise God. I want you to worship God on your way up there. And I want you to have the faith to say, we're coming back down together um, after we go up. And so, and after Abraham did that in verse 14, this is where we get Jehovah Jireh because Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh as, as it is said to this day, um, because God provided for him. 
and he said, and in blessing, I will bless you. And in multiplying, I didn't even know it said that in there. My God, I mean, ain't got something else. I didn't even know this thing said this here. I must not have read further down. Genesis 22 verse 17 says that in blessing, I will bless you. And in multiplying, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore and the seed shall possess the gates of his enemy. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Lay this thing at the altar. Lay your desire at the altar. Kill it. Oh, thank you, Jalen. Uh, let's go back to Genesis 22, verse 8. That was a favorite one. I must not have it highlighted. And Abraham said, my God, will you provide... My, he said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And both of them went together. He knew that God was going to provide the lamb. I'm telling, can y'all just read this by yourself, please? I'm telling y'all, this is a good thing. Because it talks about altars and the video you were supposed to watch today for the fast is the art of war. It's I'm going to put the link in there, but it's on my YouTube page. And we're dealing with destroying demonic altars and covenants and things of that nature. And so uh, thank you, everybody. It's John chapter 12, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And so we are going to focus on killing this desire. This is for those of you that have been obsessed with a certain man or woman being your husband, being your wife. God is not calling us to delusion. He's not calling us to being mad men or women. He does not want us to lose our mind in this process. God is a God of sobriety. He, want us, he wants us to remain emotionally sober so that we can be vigilant in this hour, so that we're not marrying counterfeits and, uh, and demonic and people that are a call to our life to bring demonic destruction to our destiny, destiny destroying relationships. I've been in a few myself, um, but you know, this is why God's mercy and God's grace and all of that is so good. So I'm getting ready to end. I know you like Tiffany, where is the prayer? I mean, y'all can pray on your own today, but here's the thing. For those of you that are sleeping with somebody's husband, go ahead and stop. Okay. Some of you right now are sleeping with somebody's husband or somebody's wife, and you're doing it because this person has left the house. You think that they are, um, you know, not with the person anymore because that's what they told you. But here's the thing. Once we get a revelation of covenant, and we're going to study covenant like never before, because the reason why people are having so many divorces and things of that nature is because there's no revelation of what covenant is. You did not make a covenant with that man and woman. They made a covenant before God. And the reason why a lot of you are able to sleep with somebody's spouses and not drop dead is because the wife or the husband uh, has not come into a full revelation of the covenant that was made with God. Okay, I'll say that again. The reason why many of you are able to sleep with somebody's husband or wife and not drop dead is because that husband and wife have not come into a full revelation of the covenant that was made with God when they got married. I don't, even if they're saved or in church or even if they're a first lady, that person has not come into a divine revelation of the covenant that they have made with God. If they understood covenant, they wouldn't even be fighting with you, baby. They would go and fight. They would go to God. They would bring him to remembrance of the covenant they made him and say, this man right here or this woman right here is coming against the covenant I made with you, God. So God of covenant, I pray that you deal with this. I don't care how you need to deal with it. Deal with it however you may. But this one right here needs to go. Now, I told a story about a woman of God. She's an older woman of God now, but a woman of God whose husband, they got saved. They were not married when they, they were not saved when they got married. And, you know, in her journey, she eventually got saved and her husband was no longer, still not saved. And so he cheated on her a lot. These people have been married right now for about 60 years. They're still married. She said her husband was cheating on her a lot, but there was one specific woman he was cheating on her with that, um, that taunted her, that mocked her, that called her and, and said things like, um, this is my man too. I'm in love with him. We're going to be a family together. Things of that nature. You know how they get sometimes. This woman of God understood covenant even as a new believer. 
even as a believer who didn't know all of God and she understood covenant. This woman of God started, stopped arguing with her husband. She stopped arguing with the woman. This woman of God went into her prayer closet, brought God into remembrance of the covenant she made with him. That lady died a week later, dropped dead, six feet under, not alive today. Understand what I'm saying to you. True story. They have now been married for about 60 years. True story. When you understand the covenant, can't nobody take your place. Can't nobody. Uh, God has to fight for you. When you look at David and Goliath, when you look at David and Goliath, obviously Goliath was much bigger than David. He was a giant. David was just a young boy. David didn't go fighting Goliath out of his own strength and power. David fought Goliath and won that war out of covenant. He won that fight because of covenant. We are going into this time of prayer and fasting every single Tuesday for the rest of this year. And we are standing on covenant. Anytime you go into fight with, anytime you go into spiritual warfare, you don't want to just go blindly. You want to ask God, what are the strategies of this warfare? What are the strategies of this warfare? Our first strategy is prayer and fasting. Our second strategy will be worship. Our third strategy will be covenant. We're not going to toil about this. We're not going to sweat blood about this. We are going to call on the God of covenant and we are going to stand on the God, what God promised us. And we are going to let God fight our battles. We're going to tell these mountains of singleness, these mountains of, of anti-marriage, this mountain of whatever, these mountains have to be removed and cast into the sea. And I don't know if you guys remember me telling you, because sometimes, you know, I don't pray nice prayers. And the reason I don't pray nice prayers, let me just say this. A lot of people get mad how I pray sometimes. Because, um, you know, the Bible does say, love those that curse you and all of that stuff. And I do. I do love them. I do. But here's the thing. If you are against me taking somebody out in prayer, because that's what I'm going to do once I realize you're trying to take me out. Pum, you're out of here. Okay. But if you don't believe in my style of praying, then you should not have a gun. In your home, you should not have a knife. You should not. Um, you shouldn't have anything that you can defend yourself with. You should just love anybody that tries to come and attack you and your children. Anybody that tries to break into your home or your car. Anybody, you know, you shouldn't. You should just love them that tried to attack you and curse you and did wrong. You should love them. So I think we just need to, the, the scripture does say that, but I think we need a revelation of what it, mean, of what it means, right? I have uh, very little mercy on many things, but I have, by the grace of God, won quite a few witches to the body of Christ who are now filled with the Holy Ghost, have renounced all of their witchcraft. And so I don't, you know, just kind of come off at them in that way because my main goal is to get you saved because the more that are on our side, the better, right? And we're dealing with spiritual warfare, which means once you're dead, the spirit gonna jump into somebody else anyway. So uh, we don't, we, my, uh, that's my goal. My ultimate goal is that. But here, here's what I'm trying to get at. In Mark 11, 23, it says, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, right? For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, this mountain may be a side chick. This mountain may be a side dude. This mountain may be the anti-marriage spirit. This mountain may be the spirit of singleness. This mountain may be all of these things. Whoso, whosoever shall say to this mountain, Mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith, which means over and over and over again, shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore, I say unto you, what things you desire when you pray, believe that you've received them. Let's go look up the word removed. I often wondered what that mean. And baby, that thing blew me away. The word removed means to be um. The word removed means to be taken away, to be carried away, to be taken away, to cause decease. But here's what here's the revelation. It also means to take away from among the living, either by natural death or by violence. So if 
If you're married and you have a covenant before God and there is a man or a woman that is interfering in your marriage trying to do it, you don't have to say kill him. You don't have to use those words. You say, be thou removed. You call him by name, call him by title. Be thou removed and be cast into the sea and you let God deal with whatever removal he wants to do because another definition of removal means to take away from another what is his or what is committed to him to take by force. Again, it says to take from among the living, either by natural death or by violence. I didn't say it. The Bible said it. So just stop cheating, y'all. Um, also, if you notice in your bloodline that a lot of the men or a lot of the women are not married or things of that nature, if you kind of look at your family history and you're like, wow, you know, none of the women are married or, you know... Um, all of the men are married, but none of the women are married or all of the men get a divorce or all of the men have babies outside of their marriage or there's so much divorce or all of the women are Jezebelic and they emasculate their men and things of that nature. That is a curse. That is the opposite of a blessing. It is a curse. And I know many of you don't think that curses are relevant in this day and age, but unfortunately they are. Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, did not die to like he he died to give us power and authority to deal with the curses. We have now power and authority to deal with these curses. You may say, well, Tiffany, that doesn't make sense. I know it doesn't make sense, but there's a curse in the book of Deuteronomy of inflammation. If you have inflammation in your body right now, any type of inflammation, you are under a curse. That is a curse in the book of Deuteronomy. So I know that we don't think that curses exist these days, but unfortunately they do. And the longer you don't take this into account, the longer they're going to run rampant in your bloodline. It behooves you to just go ahead and cancel these curses like he died on the cross to give us the ability to do. Um, if there were no curses, you wouldn't be in the hospital dealing with the spirit of infirmity, which is a curse. A curse is the opposite of a blessing. And so just like blessings are still relevant today, unfortunately, curses are still relevant today. If, if everybody in your family dies of a certain disease, cancer, diabetes, heart attack, that's a curse on that bloodline. If many people have mental illness or have nervous breakdowns, that's a curse on that bloodline. We also see people that have generational blessings on a bloodline, that people live into their hundreds, that people have their right minds even in their old age, that everybody gets married and they have these beautiful marriages and fruitful wombs and everybody's having these babies and nobody ever gets sick. Those are generational blessings over a bloodline. And so um, many of us are dealing with anti-marriage spirits. We're dealing with um, these very demonic things and, and things of this nature. So we're not dealing with a natural thing. We're dealing with a spiritual principle that by God's grace, by God's power, we are going to break through the power of prayer and fasting. So uh, let me leave you with this. The uh, the four, gosh, I don't even know. Here are, the, here are the four or five things I want you to deal with for the rest of today for our fast. Unforgiveness, unforgiveness, unforgiveness. I think that this should be the main thing we deal with because unforgiveness stops your prayers from being answered, period. I don't care how saved you are. I don't care if you've been going to church for 14,000 years. It does not matter. If you have a heart of unforgiveness, your prayer, you can go ahead and just stop praying and fasting now. It does not go ahead and eat, honey. It doesn't matter. You have to forgive them for what they did to you. You got to forgive him for cheating on you. You have to forgive him for betraying you with your best friend or your sister or your brother, or you have to forgive him for sleeping with a man. You got to forgive her for stepping out on you and cheating on you with everybody. You got to forgive them for raping you. You got to forgive them for molesting you. You have to forgive them. This does not mean that these people should not spend the rest of their living life in prison. This does not mean that the justice and vengeance of God will still not be their portion. Doesn't mean that. But what I am saying is scriptural. Your prayers, no matter how justified your unforgiveness is, your prayers will forever be unanswered if you don't stop right now and go and forgive these people for what they've done to you. That's just something that has to be done. You have to forgive them. Um, and so before we start with anything, before we start with the rest of this year, now I don't know about y'all. But I'm safe for real. And I be having to forgive people on a weekly basis. It's just, it's just, I use it like a bowel movement in the body, right? We're never too saved to have a lifestyle of repentance. We're never too saved to have a life, especially all, all, all of us who are leaders. And I believe that many of you are leaders. Um, but all of us that are leaders, we deal with hits every day. We deal with people who we thought were 
um, loyal and we thought were going to be with us for a while and they betray you and you're trying to preach the gospel and doing good things and you're just taking hit after hit, of course that will harden your heart a little bit. Of course that will rain on you and you trying to kind of work in this unforgiveness. And so weekly as a bowel movement process, I, Tiffany, um, go through forgiveness every single week. I repent every single week. I'm human. I do something every day that piss y'all off. I do something every day that piss God off. I do every I do something every little day to piss myself off a little bit. You know what I'm saying? I am a human being. And so just to make sure I'm always in right standing with God, um, every single week I go through this bowel movement process in the realm of the spirit of, um, of of repentance and forgive and forgiveness and here's the thing y'all sometimes i got to forgive the same person every single day for like two months until it happens and forgiveness may not you might not feel like you forgiven but that's why we're killing this flesh it doesn't matter what you feel we don't feel like forgiving uh, but forgiveness is a decision and sometimes a decision you make doesn't feel good, but we're not a people that are led by our feelings. We are forgiving them. We have made the decision that we forgave them and we're not gonna allow our flesh to lie to us that we have not forgiven. This may be something that you need to do every day. And let me hear me very clearly. When you all forgive that person today, many of you won't have back pain anymore. Many of you won't have breast pain anymore. Many of you won't have those migraine headaches because your unforgiveness has turned into a spirit of infirmity. And once you have broken um, this yoke of unforgiveness, your body will, the health of your body will spring forth speedily. You will not be dealing with um, these infirmities anymore. You will not be a woman who is in her 40s or 50s in an 80 year old, 90 year old body. God is going to release supernatural healing in your body now in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, we're also gonna work on breaking soul ties today. And I know many of you do not think that soul ties are real. Many of you are like, soul ties are not biblical. You know, argue with your mama. I don't know what you want me to do. So there are good soul ties and there are bad soul ties. But here's the thing. A soul, according to the Bible, is your mind, your will, and your emotions. When you look up the definition of the word soul, you can get the, it's your mind, your will, and your emotions. Now, we all know that sometimes our mind, our will, and our emotions are tied to a organization, are tied to a lover, whether it's a current lover or an ex-lover, are tied to um, your work. A soul tie is tied to a best friend or a parent. Your soul, or in other words, your mind, your will, and your emotions are tied to this thing, whether good or bad. Well, we want to today break all ungodly soul ties. Now, what does this look like? You may say, well, Tiffany, there's no such thing. My soul can't be tied to anything. Again, your mind, your will, and your emotions can definitely be tied to things as you've seen before in your own life. Don't argue with me. And so also I have scripture according to Psalms 23, three, he says, God restoreth my soul. Remember the ETH means over and over and over again. Well, why would he need his soul restoreth if it didn't go anywhere? Because when you restore something, you bring it back. Why does he need his soul restored if it didn't leave him? When you have a soul tie, this is your mind, your will, and your emotions. It's tied, linked, locked. I want you to pretend that my two hands are logs. They're, they're wooden logs. Well, guess what? When you stop sleeping with somebody or you stop dealing with somebody or anything, what you do is you rip it apart. But just because you ripped it apart doesn't mean that the logs on here are not now glued over here. And the logs that once belonged to this log are not glued right here. And so now you have fragmented pieces of your soul that are now a part of you that came from somebody else that do not belong there. And this is why your life is like it is, is because you have holes in your mind, your will, and your emotions in the realm of the spirit. And so we want to take those parts of your soul that have been fragmented, and we want to ask God, according to Psalms 23, 3, to restoreth our souls, restoreth our souls back to us. 
And also, the last thing I want us to work on is our faith because all this year will be a faith walk. And we're not gonna walk by what we see, we're gonna walk by what we proclaim. And so we're gonna spend a lot of our time every Tuesday proclaiming the word of God, confessing the word of God. Um, and a lot of us have a faith deficiency in the realm of the spirit. Some of you are like, Tiffany, your faith ain't even as big as a mustard seed. You know, that God talks about the gift of faith, which is one of the um, nine gifts of the spirit. And then he said, hey, if, if you don't have that, you can have faith the size of a mustard seed. But let's be honest, some of us don't even have faith the size of a mustard seed. But I want you to look at your faith like, um, like a part of your body, right? And anytime out of your mouth, you start talking against it and you don't believe it and you start talking negatively, I want you to now say, I have a faith deficiency, right? Just like you may have an iron deficiency or a B12 deficiency in your body, right? You may have a vitamin D deficiency, right? And you know that because of how either you got blood work done, which is what prayer and fasting is, is you going to get your blood work done in the realm of the spirit for God to show you what's wrong with you and show you what you're deficient in, or you can see it because maybe your hair is getting brittle, your nails are brittle, but in the realm of the spirit, you can see it through your mouth and what you've been saying and your life and what you haven't been able to see manifest in your life. And so um, the spirit of God is saying a lot of us have a faith deficiency and we're going to fill this up. We're going to take a, a medicine in the realm of the spirit, which is the word of God, which is the word of God. We're going to take the, the vitamin of the word of God, the supplement of the word of God, and we're going to input it into us so that our faith is full because the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so if we are going into this fast with a lot of doubt, with a lot of this can't happen to me. I believe it can happen to anybody else. Well, guess what? Your prayers, are, you're going to have whatever you say. Your prayers will not get answered. So we want to give God the currency of faith so he can pay us back with what, we've, what, what we're contending for and praying for. Amen. Well, my name is Tiffany. I am a prophetess of God. I am a teacher of the good news of Jesus Christ. I have a ministry called Covered by God. We meet this Thursday, so make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel because we're going to be live in Atlanta, Georgia this Thursday. I have a special guest for you and I'm very excited about it, but my name means manifestation of God. My name, the name Tiffany means manifestation of God. And I am calling on the God of covenant who named me the manifestation of God to manifest himself through these supernatural marriages in the year of 2022. God said, not Tiffany, God said that this year was the year of the bride. And we are believing God that he will manifest himself in the life of everybody. In the year 2019, I don't know why God has made these little fingers baby making fingers, okay? But there has never been anybody that I have not prayed for that had documented by doctor standards said that you could never have a baby. I have never had anybody that I personally have prayed for by the grace of God that has not given, that has not had a baby, pregnant with a baby, is getting ready to have a baby, or has given birth from a baby, given giving birth to a baby, right? And so there are just certain things that God has covenanted me with that I know for sure I have this certain grace, whether I have it or not. And I know for sure that God is giving me the grace in this hour for supernatural marriages. This is not just marriages just for fun, but I am a prophetess to, a, to the nations. I'm a prophet to the nations. And this marriage um, drought that we're seeing right now is a national epidemic in the realm of the spirit and in the natural. And we're going to see by the grace of God, a manifestation of the power of God and these marriages springing forth all over the place by God's grace. We're going to do it whole. We're going to marry the right people. We're going to marry the right spouses. There will no, there will be no counterfeits in the name of Jesus Christ. And God is turning it around. Let me leave you with one last thing before I go, and this is in the Message Bible. God had me reading the book of Esther all this month. I read it in uh, I read it in the KJV and in the Message version because this month is actually the month of Purim. This is the month where Esther went on her three-day dry fast. It actually happened last week sometime. Um, and so I was just, you know, talking to God about this thing. But here's what's powerful about this month. This is why I want, I was going to start the fast at the beginning of next month, but I was like, no, I really want to be aligned with what God is doing in this month in particular, because he said, in, um, the Bible says in the message version, Esther chapter nine, it says, 
but the tables were now turned. But the tables were now turned. I want you to hold that. After they went on their three-day fast, after they went on their fast, they, they didn't drink any water. They didn't eat any food. After they went on this fast, the message version says, but the tables were now turned. That's what I'm going to title this today's. The tables have now turned. That's what we are believing God for. You might not see it in the natural, but in the realm of the spirit, hear what I'm saying to you. The tables have now turned and they have turned in your favor. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you for what you're doing on this earth. We thank you, Father, that we are a part of history and calling those things that are not as though they already are. We thank you, Holy Ghost, that you are brooding over us and the power and the presence of God is over each of these days. Father, we thank you for everybody under the sound of my voice. We thank you, God, that you are bringing them to emotional sobriety. We thank you, Father, that any madman on here e immediately gets his right mind. Mind. And we thank you, Father, that the spirit of suicide over the men of God has been canceled, Father. We curse every spirit of suicide over our husbands, our brothers, our sons, our fathers, our nephews. God, we call them to repentance now in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father, that you have completely, that you've given us the mantle of, the, uh, of killing the spirit of pride, of putting a hook in the mouth of Leviathan, Father. And we thank you in the name of Jesus that you have beheaded this this. this disastrous monster named Leviathan, Father, that you have given us a mantle to destroy the spirit of pride, Father, and that you have clothed these men with a garment of humility, that you have brought them back into their right minds, that you have humbled them, Father, that they can think straight, that they can see straight, that they can make the right decision, Father. We even contend right now, God, that any of these men that are in relationships with witches, un unawares, Father, we declare that you uproot every witch, every warlock out of the lives of our spouses is now in the name of Jesus, every spirit of distraction, every man or woman, God, that is a distraction in the lives of our, um, of our, uh, assigned God-given husband or spouse or wife, Father, we declare that you uproot this distraction out of their lives right now in the name of Jesus Christ. We declare, Father, that our spouses now come into the full counsel of God concerning the, our marriage. We pray for supernatural agreement right now, Father, that our spouses agree with the plan and purpose of heaven, God, concerning our marriage, Father, in the name of Jesus. And we declare that our marriage is glorious. We declare that our marriage is fruitful. We declare, Father, that our marriage is in agreement agreement with your will concerning the kingdom of God's assignment on this earth, Father. And we declare, Father, that we will see this come to pass in the land of the living. Father, we come against that lie that we just have to wait for it. And we know that you've given us power and authority to declare these things on earth now. The time is now. The time is now now, Father. So we use our mouth, God. We declare, we make a vow that we will not use our mouths against you and what you're doing, Father, but we will use our mouths with architectural design, Father, to design our future according to the will of God and according to the plan and purposes of God over our life, Father. We break every anti-marriage spirit over our life, God. Every anti-marriage spirit over our bloodline is broken now in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, every evil covenant that we are coming to agreement with knowingly or unknowingly, knowingly, we renounce it, we divorce it, we break it, God. We come out of covenant with you, Father, and we declare that we are back in covenant with you. Father, take uh, take dominion, take reign, take rule, uh, and take your rightful place back in our life, Father. We renounce every place that we've given the enemy access to our life, God, and we say, take your rightful place back in our lives in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we forgive everybody who has done us wrong. Father, give us the faith to forgive these people. Father, we make a decision today to forgive them, God, in the name of Jesus Christ. We ask God, only and only you can do this, that you would take this person out of our heart, that when we think of them or see them, we don't lose our appetite, that when we go to sleep at night, their face is not the face that we see. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you would give us the gift of forgiveness with the evidence, Father, that when this person's name is brought up, it is like a stranger's name is brought up to them, God. I pray in the the name of Jesus Christ, that any spirit of infirmity that was allowed legal access to the lives of your people because of the spirit of unforgiveness. Father, I pray that a supernatural healing
healing springs forth into the life of your people. Let a supernatural healing, God, spring forth in our white blood cells, in our red blood cells. Let a supernatural healing take place in our minds, God, in our hearts, God. I bind the spirit of heart attack and stroke, God, because of broken hearts on here in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, heal our hearts, God. Heal our hearts from those relationships we should have never been in. The Bible says the wages of sin are death. And even though we might not see anybody drop dead immediately, these people that are dying of heart attacks and strokes, God, are because of broken hearts of relationships they should have never been in in the beginning. People dying of venereal diseases, God, and other things, cancers in their body because of bitterness, because of what a man or woman did that they should have never been in that relationship. The wages of sin our death means more than what we think it means. Father, forgive us for being ignorant of your word. Forgive us for not coming into a full knowledge of what your word means. Forgive us, God, for not rightly dividing the word. We ask in the name of Jesus that you give us the faith to forgive. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you in the name of Jesus Christ that even after this prayer, God, you don't remember any of our faults and neither will we remember what we've done. And we, God, we forgive now the most important person in our lives, ourselves. In the name of Jesus, we forgive ourselves for getting into bad relationships. We forgive ourselves for staying in bad relationships. We forgive ourselves, God, for, for ignoring you and all of the red flags that we thought was a clown circus that we was going to have a little bit of fun in. Father, we forgive ourselves for being stupid. We forgive ourselves for making stupid decisions decisions. And we thank you that you are a merciful God and that you've shown us mercy and grace in this hour, Father, and that you have literally blotted out our transgressions and blotted out our sins and you remember them no more. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the faith to forgive. And we thank you, God, that we are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you would fill us up with faith, God that you would give us faith, God, that that is just, un give us the gift of faith. That's what I ask over everybody right now. And I pray, God, that the hand of God is on our life. I declare, God, that we will testify this year, that this year is truly the year of the bride. We will be sensitive to what you're saying. We will be sensitive. If you're telling us to cut this man off, cut this woman off today, they are gone, Father. We will radically obey you because we will see the promises of God come to pass in our life in this hour in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen, 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 amen. Now we got the rest of Tuesdays for the rest of this year to pray. I have a whole, I could have gone on really for five hours today, but I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna just wait until next week to come up with our next um, topic of what we need to deal with. But don't worry about praying for your spouse today or for the rest of this week. We need to get ourselves in order. We need to get our hearts in order and we need to get just our minds ready and prepare for what God is doing in this hour. I'm gonna put in the description box all of the books I want you to read, all of the lives you're supposed to watch today for the rest of this month, right? For the rest of this month. So next month we'll have a new set of books and things of that nature, but we are going to... Um, have a list of that in the description box. Also, please, oh, I almost forgot. Whenever you are fasting, I think so many ministries do you a disservice by not telling you this. Anytime you are fasting, people of God hear me, you want to give to the poor. I thank you for giving to me. I'm going to put a link in the description box for you to give to our ministry covered by God. But please understand that God does something on your behalf when you give to the poor, when you give to the poor, when you give to the poor. Um, so please make sure today or this week you go out and give to the poor. Um, in, the, in the book of Acts chapter 10, this is new covenant now. This is new covenant. The Bible says that there was a devout man, one that feared God with all of his house and gave much alms to the people and he prayed always. Well, alms means giving to the poor, right? It means giving to the poor. In verse four, an angel came to him and said, um, your, the angel said, your prayers and your alms are come up as a memorial before God, which means even in the new covenant, him giving to the poor made God respond. Our worship makes God respond. Our praise makes God respond. And our giving to the poor makes God respond. So I want you to give to the poor as aggressively as you want somebody to answer your prayers. If right now, you know that somebody right now is holding on to the answer to your prayer 
prayer and they're taking their precious time to get it to you. Well, I want you to change your narrative and I want you to find somebody that's poor this week or home. It doesn't matter. And I want you to give to them as aggressively as you want the person to answer your prayer. Now you may say, Tiffany, I'm a little poor. So what you want me to do? I, I don't have anybody to give, but again, stop using your words as a graveyard to your life. You are not poor. You are a wealthy man. You are a wealthy woman in a poor situation right now that you are actively getting yourself out of, that God is going to give you the light of instruction. He's going to illuminate that dark path to give you strategy to get you out of this situation. Never again call yourself single if you don't want to be. Stop calling yourself poor if you are wealthy. I want you to say to yourself, I am wealthy. I just happen to be in a poor situation right now. And I just believe God for a strategy for you. Y'all let me go. Um, make sure you follow me. Subscribe to my YouTube channel right now. I've been, I've become one of those YouTube people. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel right now. Go follow me on Instagram um, at Tiffany Montgomery, T-I-P-H-A-N-I -I, Montgomery. Won't be for long, but Instagram.com forward slash Tiffany Montgomery. And uh, I think that is all. We meet for Covered by God uh, this Thursday uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And so please make sure you are subscribed and you watch because we have a special guest and I am very excited. I have a very, I have a lot of surprises for you and it's just going to be a powerful time, but we are going to see answers to our prayers in a way that is going to completely blow us away. So I love you guys. I thank you guys. Um, I think that's it. So bye.